over what a dystopia is. A dystopia is a fictional land. That means it's fake. It's not real. It's made up. So it's a fictional land where things are so horrible, and they're horrible for one of two reasons. They're horrible because there are too many rules and it's oppressive, or they're horrible because there are no rules and it's chaos. So it's either chaos or oppression. Those are the two reasons that a dystopian world is horrible. Um, most famous dystopia you've probably heard. Who's seen Oblivion lately? Dystopia, correct? Yeah. What about the one when there's a planet and all the people on the planet are really healthy and live in these huge oh, mansions? Oh, is it with? And then down below, what is it called? Um, I don't know what's called. Is it with? I, uh, I know, I know. Wally. E. No. no. Wally is a dystopia, yeah, that's a but dystopia. it's not with Wally. It's it with, with uh, e. Horn. 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 Let me check. I know no, what no, you're no. talking about. It's, yeah, he's in the movie. And he's got the exoskeleton. It's called, it's called something, Elise. Elysium? Yeah, Elysium. Oh, there you go, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, a utopia means a perfect world. So if it is a utopia, it is perfect. Utopia is impossible. There's no such thing as an actual perfect world. Um, nobody dies. Nobody gets cancer. There is no violence. There is only happiness. No tears of sadness, only tears of joy. That's oh. fake. That doesn't exist. Contrast against that is a dystopia. So those two words are connected, utopia and dystopia. And so... One question that will be on your exam at the end of all this is, what is a utopia and what is a dystopia? You need to know those. You can't even understand the book if you don't know what the difference is between utopia and dystopia. Typical dystopia, it starts off with a utopia. Everything looks perfect in the beginning, and then all of a sudden you find out it's not perfect. There's really this other side to it. All right? Um, dystopia. Typically, it means there are lots of unfair rules. There's a curfew. There's a, a world in which um, people are oppressed by the rules, and not everybody has to follow them. The rich people don't have to follow them. Um, polarization means only the opposites. There's nothing in between, only the opposite. So really, really rich, really, really poor, nothing in between. Doesn't follow any rules, has to follow crazy rules, nothing in between. OK? Um, any questions so far? Um, dystopian literature is a critique of the world, so it is a way to say something is wrong. I'm going to turn these off just in case. Okay, it's it's saying something is wrong with the world. So the most typical um, dystopias um, that exist, Gulliver's Travel. We think of it as a children's book, but it's really a dystopia. Um, Superiority of Man, and I think that it's written with um, Superiority of Man. The Trial is um, by Franz Kafka. He also wrote a book called The Metamorphosis, which we will read. It's about a uh, man who gets turned into a cockroach. Um, but the trial is less famous, but more noteworthy. It's about a man who um, is accused of a crime he didn't commit, gets arrested, convicted to, to death, and then gets killed. And he's innocent. And the whole time he's saying, I'm innocent, but the judicial bureaucracy, bureaucracy means when people follow the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law. Um, it means when people get caught up about the rules and they don't think about the people involved in them. All right, so this is a critique. It's a warning against faith, placing too much faith in judicial rules. Um, the Iron Heel is a book, um, it was one of the first um, dystopias ever written. It takes place in Chicago. It's basically about our economic system and how flawed it is and how the poor people get exploited. And all these poor people rise up and they unionize and they bring the economic system to a halt. They block all the trains, they do all this stuff. And the, the way the American government responds is everybody come, they bring the military into Chicago with guns and they start shooting people in waves and there are piles of thousands of people just dead built up all over Chicago. So it takes this real rule or this real life situation and it takes it to an extreme where it shows how outrageous it is. Wally, and I apologize for this, I'm gonna fix it right now. Oh. Crap, I was hurt. <laughs> how do I fix this? Let's see. There we go. Now it doesn't have the L, Technologica, old oh, down there. Okay? Um, Wally, she said, Wally. Wally is a dystopia because it teaches us um, that when we get too caught up in technology and consumerism, we forget about who we are as humans. So it is a warning against technology. You can see that in the film. All the people are really fat, they can't even get out of their chairs, they're floating around with these screens. Remind you of some people right now? Screens? <laughs> <laughs> All right? Um, those are examples. These are the most famous dystopian literature. Um, so dystopic isn't a word, but I'm going to use it because it kind of makes sense. Dystopic literature. Um, 1984. Who's heard of 1984, the novel or the movie before? Anybody? Anybody heard of it? Um, who's heard of George Orwell? Who's George Orwell? The author, right? 
author of 1984. That's excellent. That question will be on your final exam, Woo! guaranteed. Nice. So you, you would have gotten that one when you've gotten Utopia Dystopia. Who knows? But you got that one, for sure. George Orwell, who is he? Author of 1984 and a book called Animal Farm. If you've heard of Animal Farm, it's about all these animals who um, take over the farm and they talk. It's kind of weird. 1984, if you've heard of the term Big Brother is watching you, who's heard of that term? Um, that's coined from the book 1984. It comes directly from that book where there's video surveillance everywhere and the government is always watching you. That comes from the book 1984. It wasn't written in 1984. It was way, way before 1984. I'm um, supposed to take place in 1984, so it's future, but it's also before you were born. I was four years old in 1984, so these ideas are not new. They've, they've existed for a long, long time. Now, with things like the NSA surveillance, it's to the point where it does feel like Big Brother is watching. Right? In these computers right now, your cameras, the government can take control of it and watch me right now, because it's pointed at me. If you doubt that that can actually happen, then you, you really aren't paying enough attention, because it is actually happening. All right? Um, Brave New World is about where science meets the future and how science can extend where they have people um, that are basically grown in a, they're manufactured in some way. Fahrenheit 451, who's heard of that? Yep. Who's read it? Oh. Um, it's about the burning of books. Firefighters no longer put out fires, they burn books, they destroy knowledge, and there are all these rules you have to follow around how you view books. This is a typical dystopia. This was more a, uh, um, a view on how technology is taking over our minds and we're reading less. He didn't intend for it to be so much of a dystopia, but it is a dystopia. On The Handmaid's Tale, the most, the most, or the least famous book on the most famous list. Um, the Handmaid's Tale is about women. If you took them and broke them into parts, there's the woman who cleans, the woman who is the wife, the woman who works hard in the garden, and then there's the woman who makes babies. Now, handmaids, that's what you call the women who make babies. And there's this one handmaid, it's her tale, get it, handmaid's tale, um, about her and um, her struggle to escape as a handmaid. Because she's assigned to a general, and basically that general is allowed to have sex with her whenever he wants to make a baby. Um, and that's her role in this society. Um, World War Z is about zombies, the giver. Anybody see the movie The Giver lately? Yep. So you've heard about some of these things. This is a book list. You are going to choose. I'm going to put you in groups, and you're going to choose three books from the list, and then you're going to be assigned one of those books. All right? Um, some of these books you won't have access to. Some of them you will. So I will meet with your group to tell you which ones you can choose from. Uh, this is where you really need to write these down. The easiest way to do this is three parts on a grid. So if you make one, two, three, and then you just follow them all the way down with examples. Um, there are three modes of control. And if you think about power, nobody has any power unless they can control something. So if you think about energy as power, that's how you control things, how you light them up, how you make them do what you want. And so you really don't have any power unless you can make somebody else do something. The only exception to this might be, do you have power over yourself? Can you make yourself do certain things? There are three types of control. There's physical control, which typically takes a form of violence. Um, can you make somebody else do what you want to? You grab them, you shove them, you say, I'm going to stab you. If you don't do this, they have to do it. That's violence, it's physical control. Next, resources. Um, resources is a, is a manipulative form of control, but it's basically like, I'm gonna starve you to death if you don't do what I want you to do. We're gonna cut off your air. You get no air until you do what I want you to do. All right? Um, so if somebody actually owns air, then it becomes, it's a crazy commodity. What movie does uh, do the bad guys own air in? Who knows? Um, uh, yeah. Total Recall. Remember? Total Recall. Yeah. Well, they want to See? Own air. That's there we go. Recall. The Lorax. The Lorax as well. So if you own air, you literally can control anybody you want to because they can't live without air. All right? <laughs> Um, intellectual and emotional control is the most chaotic. So I'm going to break this down for you with three examples right now. Three simple, easy examples. You are a teenager, so there are three things that can happen to you when you come home late. And, and as a teenager, it shifts and changes. Number one, you come home late, what's wrong with you? Get a switch, get the belt, I'm knocking you out. Don't come home late, how dare you come home late. Now, we know that this works for little kids, and even for little kids, it works only for a limited amount of time in a limited way. If you hit your kid, and that's the only means of control you utilize for your children, they hate you, and they want to leave. It's very simple. Some people might say, oh, Adrian Peterson, he was allowed to hit her. That was okay. No. Who knows what Adrian Peterson did? What did he do? 
He abused his kids. This is a different one. That's Ray Rice. You're talking about something else. He actually punched Ray in the face. That was oh, bad. Geez. Adrian Peterson um, was arrested more than once for hitting his kid. Now, he hit his kid in the car. He actually punched his kid in the face and gave him a huge mark on his face. So it wasn't just like get a switch and spank your bottom. It was like punch your child in the face. Now, he's a superman. He's not a regular man. He's like if you took three of me and you like just added me to my arms and my legs and like he's huge and he hit his kid. Um, if we use this as our only means of control, even if we think of just in your life, when we go belong to a beyond to a political perspective, it doesn't function very well, right? People outgrow it very quickly. But this is you came home late, smack. This is you came home late, what? Your phone gets taken away. Um, your TV privileges get taken away. You're grounded. You can't leave the house. Go to bed without dinner. That's what control of resources is. So this is in your life. It exists. You can see how people try and use these modes of control on you. The last one is you came home late and Good somebody talk. says to you, I can't believe you did this to me. I've been so nervous. How could you do this to me? If you loved me, you would never do this to me. Guilt. 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 They try and use your emotions to get you to do something. A good child would never do this. If you want to be a good child, you would never do this. How many people experience this in their household? There's some form of guilt that's used three. to try and control you. Some form of Every manipulation. Day. Can you raise your feet? <laughs> All right. So you see, the most complex is here. This is the place where you get people to believe they've done something wrong, so they change their behavior. This is... This is clear, this is transparent. You know they're trying to control you. When you get here, it becomes internal to the point where the person can disappear and your behavior will stay the same. Even when they're not there, the behavior stays the same. All right, um, so we're gonna go a little more in depth. When you talk about political systems trying to utilize violence for control, what it looks like is you have a military or a police state. And the reason a military or police state is not a good thing is because um, a police state is another, it's a form of like, overarching oppressive government control. Um, so what it, this looks like is the military, the people with the AK-47s, not the people with the batons, but with the AK-47s are policing a nation. Now, anybody here know somebody enrolled in the military right now? Um, enrolled is the wrong word. Um, enlisted. Yes. In the military, they do not train you to serve and protect. So one of the problems when we went to Afghanistan and we tried to hold cities in Afghanistan is the military is not trained to police. They're trained to kill. And so when you're in the military, you are trained to kill people. You're not trained to control them. You're not trained to do anything other than find and kill. That's what you are. You're an agent of killing. All right, so when you do this in your own citizen citizenry, the people in your country, and you're threatening them and you kill them, eventually they're gonna rise up against that power. You can only threaten so long before somebody stands up and says, let's get them. Because you imagine for every thousand people, there's one military police officer, right? The police aren't one to one. They're not one to 10 or one to 100. There's a whole bunch of people and very few police, all right? Um, and there are secret police on top of that in a military state. There are people who are watching. Nazi Germany, who knows what yeah, Hitler's youth were? Yeah. Anybody know Hitler's youth that happened in real time? It was real world. Hitler's youth were, it's like the Boy Scouts for Hitler. So you have all these little kids, seven, eight, nine, ten who show up and they're like, you want to be the best German you can be. And you know what the best German you can be means? That means if you hear mommy and daddy saying something bad about Germany, you come and tell us. If you hear mommy and daddy saying, oh, we're watching out for the Jews, you come and tell us. And so they meet every week and the little kids say, oh, my daddy, he said that he's gonna help the Jews. And then the, secret, or the military police show up and they say, we're arresting you. And they kill them or arrest them and the kids are then become a ward of the state, become a part of the government. Um, but they basically use people's kids to, to get them and find them. All right, so secret police, you don't know who they actually are, but that adds another um, area of nervousness and fear. Disappearings were used all over Latin America in real time. Um, you set up these governments, you don't like them in the US, so we send the CIA down, now, down there, and what they do is they put people in planes that they didn't like that would speak out against the government and they'd fly them out over the ocean and they'd shove them out of the plane. There's no body, they're gone, they just disappeared, poof. Don't exist anymore. All right, so it's not like it's really murder, they're, they're just not there anymore. They're gone. And so if, you, if somebody's doing something you don't like and there's no body and no weapon and the government does it, who holds them accountable? 
They do this to anybody who's speaking out against the government. So you say something that the government doesn't like, she's trying to blind me over there. They get rid of them. They just, they're gone. And in the movie Deeper Vendetta, they call it black bagging. They put them in a black bag, and then the black bag disappears. Okay? Um, exploitation of relationships. Maybe you're no longer afraid, but your children, your mom and your dad, your wife, your auntie, your uncle, they can, they, they can threaten other people's lives, and that's how they can control you, right? Um, it's dominated by fear. When governments use this, it's really, really, really just about fear. Can you use this and have it function for your citizens to get them to do work for you? Well, how long do you think this lasts alone? Right? You think about in terms of slavery, this is another, so you can think about in terms of I'm a teenager and this is what happens in my household. You can think of it in terms of political government, or you can think of it in terms of slavery. Chattel slavery in this country, which means slaves which were treated like property, they were owned. How do you control them? So what happened is it started like this. We're going to physically control them. We're going to whip them. We're going to threaten their lives. And eventually, not very long into it, people say, F this. I'm done, you can hit me as much as you want, I'm not working anymore. And if your goal is to get work from somebody and they stop working, you're losing. So you hit them and hit them and they say, I'm not working anymore. You hit them and hit them and you say, I'm not working anymore. It stops. You no longer have control over them because they're not afraid, right? And so then you move to this, control of resources. So if it's slaves, you say, I'm gonna cut off your food, I'm not gonna feed you. And eventually somebody says, fine, starve me to death, I don't care. I'm not working. There's nothing to live for. Why would I work? You're going to hit me, and you're not going to feed me no matter what I do. What am I living for, right? Um, this is the same as um, in the Hunger Games when there's a limited amount of food. Who's seen the Hunger Games, right? Um, intentionally, there's a limited amount of food because I can manipulate people. You each get three rations. You each get three let rations. You each get three. You get four. But you've got to tell me if any of them do something wrong. Then what happens? You're watching them because you get more food and you need more food to live. They're angry with you, so you're, they're, they're yelling at you instead of yelling at me. I just have to show up and ask you and then walk out of the way. So you're doing all the work for me then. And you're doing it all for the same food you deserve to live as a human being. And they're getting less. You're just getting the same that you really deserve. Or maybe I give you a little bit extra and that extra motivates you to snitch on more people. And you're in the exact same spot as them. All you have is a little more food. Right? So, when you talk about food as a ration, that's a means of control. You can control people with that. Not only because you can just say, hey, you don't get this, but you can turn people against each other. All right? Um, this gets even crazier when you think about things like oil. Oil is a resource, right? If you have lots of oil, you can sell your oil to whoever you want. What if you choose not to sell it? So think about the political conflicts the US gets into. If we get into these conflicts with people, there's an end game in mind. We want more control over things. So if somebody's telling us they won't give us their oil, we have an in incentive to go start a conflict with them to take the oil from them. All right? Um, access to medicine or vaccines. We have Ebola here. The Ebola, if there was an Ebola outbreak in this country, um, the person who owns that Ebola medicine or vaccine would make a lot of money. You can imagine, right? They make a lot of money. So they have a financial incentive to it breaking out. So what happens if they plant it and spread it? And then they turn around and they sell you the stuff. They benefit. They don't want people to know they spread it, but so they can accident it's accidentally spread by somebody and then it's out there, but then they make all this profit off of selling their vaccine. A number one cause of death in Africa, who knows what it is? Not having water. Nope. Similar, it's close to that though. It's called diarrhea. Everybody in here has had diarrhea. It might feel like a, a raw subject, so to speak. Ha ha ha. Right? Um, everybody's had diarrhea. Um, babies die from diarrhea because they get dehydrated. They don't have enough nutrients in their system. Their water gets depleted. They don't have salt in their system, so they die. How are you doing there? All right. Um, so water is um, lack of water or dehydration. Number one cause of death. Do you know what it costs to, to solve that problem? It costs about five cents. Five pennies can solve that problem. You can make something that helps somebody not have diarrhea in a chemistry lab and it costs five cents for all the materials. Why don't we solve this problem? No, we, do, we, we care, but we don't we care about people. Cents. It costs five cents. We but, want that five cents. We, but here, you know how much they sell that for? They sell it for five dollars. <laughs> so there's four ninety five profit in every, in every single pill they're selling and it costs five cents to make. But we don't give it to Africa because we have, they can't afford more than five cents. 
So you can't make money off of it. That's pretty insane, is it not? That, that yeah. this pill that costs five cents to make, we sell it for five dollars for four dollars and ninety-five cents of profit. That's like that's twenty times profit. That's more than twenty times profit. That's two hundred times profit or something. What is it? Twenty times five equals a dollar. <laughs> times five equals it's a hundred times profit. Somebody could have done math faster than that. Add the zeros, right? <laughs> um, this is the most complex, complex means of control right here. In um, political terms, uh, we talk about in your house when you come home late. This is, you should feel so guilty. How could you treat me that way? You're breaking my heart. Oh, oh no. Right? In slave terms, this is the Bible. The tool that was used to control slaves was the Bible. You take out all the parts of the Bible that mention... Um, the, the Jews leaving, um, where, anybody know the story? They're making a movie about it. It's called Exodus. You guys haven't seen? Batman's in it. Yeah, I've seen the previews. I've seen the preview, right? Yeah. Moses. Let's read the sea walks through. Yeah. yeah. Right? Um, but the story in the Bible is that Moses frees the slaves. They leave Egypt. He takes them all out of Egypt. So you take that story out of the Bible and you give it to people and you say, read this, read this, celebrate this. It says, all the way from the point where they leave, there's slavery in the Bible. It's okay. But you know what? You're going to be a good slave because you're going to work for the afterlife. You do everything you're supposed to do now, and then when you die, you're going to get everything you deserve. That's what it says in the Bible. And so you put that in front of somebody, and you, you have them believing that they should be as good a slave as possible because God made them a slave. I didn't make you a slave. God made you a slave. God is responsible for this. I'm not responsible for this. I'm just following the rules ordained by God. And so that becomes ingrained in people's beings and their sense of their soul and their sense of their, their, their purpose in life. And it gives them a sense of hope. People will work for this. And the things that slave owners did to support this, it's pretty ingenious. They said, you know what? You can have Sunday off because Sunday is a holy day. You don't have to work on Sunday. You get Sunday off, and we're going to let you have some, some, some Bibles to read. But I guess we took the extra parts out, the parts we don't want you to see. And we're going to let you have some slave ministers and slave preachers so they can talk to you about it. So there's community that's built. And in turn, you're going to work harder for us because you think working harder for us will mean that you go to heaven. So you're controlling people's minds. You're controlling their hearts. You're controlling their spirituality. Um, and as a result, they're willing to do more for you. Um, in a political setting, in a political setting, it becomes very important to control what people are thinking about. Because if they're thinking about um, love and equal rights and equal pay and human rights, then they're gonna they're gonna uprise against you. You don't want them thinking about that. So you censor things. The easiest definition of censorship in this country is you can't look at naked people and see violence. Those are the things that you think of as most censored. Video games are censored, you can't buy them until you're a certain age. Music is censored, you can't buy until a certain age. Um, pornography is censored, um, movies are censored. But books, does anybody in here have a, have a book with no pictures censored? Books get censored too. And the more important thing is if you censor books, you're killing ideas. So let's take this to Nazi Germany. Um, the first, one of the first things Hitler does is he burns all the books. Anybody know why? It's so they can't be, so they can't, be smart and so you're, you're, you're killing ideas. And if you kill ideas, then people aren't going to push back on the ideas that you give them. You leave people with only one or two ideas, and they're basically the same. Rather than the 100 ideas that exist, they're not going to push back. This guy, Pol Pot, um, in Cambodia. Anybody know about Pol Pot in Cambodia, Khmer Rouge? Mm -hmm. What do you know about him? Um, he's, it's a slaughter fest, typically, where you just... Put people out there. And so he committed genocide. He came, came, killed about two million people in a couple years. Two million people, and in the, in the the Jewish Holocaust, they killed six million Jews, Gypsies, and others. He killed two million in only a couple of years. It wasn't some long span of time. It was a couple of years. And the way he did it is he took all the professors, all the teachers, all the educated people out in the field, and he just had them shot. Just line up and line up and just shoot all the educated people. Why kill all the educated people? You're killing all the ideas. So kill the ideas first, and then people don't get pushed back upon. All right, so censorship and control of information is very important. In this day and age, the way that it happens is control of the media. So we think about this. There are six corporations that own all TV stations, all book publishers, 
All the major movies are made by six corporations. They're called multinational conglomerates. So you have something like Disney. If you guys are going to talk, sit next to each other and talk, and then not listen, I don't have a problem with it, but you're going to need to move outside of the class to do it. Okay? So Disney. Disney owns ESPN. It owns Kraft. It owns all these other corporations. Um, so you have subsidiary cor corporations that are smaller. If, you, if there are six people that own all the media outlets, whose opinions do you get? You get only those six people's opinions. Now, in, a, in an average news, 5 to 5.30, the 5 o'clock news, you think it's a half an hour. Why isn't it an actual half hour? Who knows how long a half an hour of TV really is? Commercials. It's 22 minutes. You watch Netflix, then each episode of The Office is 22 minutes. It's not 30 minutes because there are eight minutes of commercials, right? If you watch the news, how much of it is weather? It's like four minutes of weather, five minutes of weather. How much of it is sports? Four or five minutes of sports, right? So now what was 12 minutes, we just took 10 minutes off of. Now, which 22 minutes is now 12 minutes. And then you take the current events, the Kim Kardashian and she's naked in a garbage bag like this. <laughs> right? Um, how much time does that stuff take up? They did this study and they found that there are three minutes of actual news in the 5 o'clock news. Three, three minutes. Three minutes of actual news in the 5 o'clock news. Um, three minutes of news that relates to your government and its control of you and its policies. Three minutes of real news. The rest of it is current events, weather, and why Why do you think they push so much on the sports? In our society, sports are a big thing, and it's not a mistake. Why does the media want to focus your attention on sports instead of the actual news? They want us to buy things. And so you think this, this corporation owns all these subsidiary corporations that buy airtime and commercials. Sports is another commercial, because if you're watching LeBron and Kobe and you're watching all the Danny and Thomas and the football players, whoever, then you want to buy the same stuff. It's an extension of commercials. So you think about it, the, the news is a lot of commercials, and it's ironic because it should be zero commercials if you think about it. Um, so active control and manipulation of the media means that they change the truth. When you're living in a dystopian state, and the closer does our media lie to us? Yeah. They tell us things that are untrue all the time, right? They make up stories, they exaggerate stories, they want you to be afraid. Um, and so that's called fear mongering. When the media makes up stories or highlights stories, there's this famous quote you should probably write down. The media doesn't tell you um, what to think, they tell you what to think about. They don't tell you what to think, they tell you what to think about. And so, um, Somebody could post this on YouTube, and then we don't need more than one person videotaping me. He's like following me like he's in video class, so maybe I he'll am. do it right after this. Oh. Um, so the media doesn't tell you what to think, they tell you what to think about. So think about, you have all these issues, and the media puts a spotlight on some of them. The ones they put a spotlight on are the three minutes that show up in the news. So there's genocide going on right now around this country. Who knows what we just did technologically that has never been done? As a, as a planet, what just happened? That's unparalleled, that's never happened before, that took ten years. Who knows what we did? We landed on a, a comet. We landed on a comet. So if you've heard, you, more people heard about Kim Kardashian and naked in a garbage bag than heard about this, this ship that went around and around the Earth how many times until it eventually came and landed on a comet? Just like Armageddon. Just like the movie Armageddon. It's insane, but it happened. And who knows what happens to the ship that landed on the comet right now? Just like in Armageddon, it landed in the wrong spot. It's part of its landing equipment broke, so it landed in the shadow of a, a cliff, and so its solar cells can't function. So right before it did, it got all these samples of the amino acids in the, in the soil, because that tells us about life. Amino, amino acids are what's in our muscles and what gets broken down over time. And it transmitted those signals. So we got all the information we needed really quick, but now it's shut down. It's in like low battery mode or something. All right, that's a huge deal, because you think, we did what they were trying to do on Armageddon. As outlandish as that seems, we landed on a comet, right? Um, more people heard about Kim Kardashian in a garbage bag. The media doesn't tell you what to think, they tell you what to think about. And so if you can control the media, you can control people's minds, right? You can focus their attention on different things. And so control of the media becomes very, very important. If you can tell people, um, you'll see in V for Vendetta, if you tell people that an event was this way or that way, then you get to shape the outcome more readily. Uh, slogans and ideas are used to control people. 
Slogans and ideas are used to control people. Um, homogeneous behavior has nothing to do with sexuality. It's time you learn. Homo means the same. Hetero means opposite. And so homogeneous means the same. That's what it means. Behaviors that are the same. Who's read the books Ugly Specials Extras? Those books, middle school books. One hand. Who's heard of them? Ugly Specials Extras. OK, thank you. Um, those are dystopias based on people being treated differently on based on how they look. Yep. Right? Um, it becomes very important for you to fit in. Because if you're in a state where everybody's judged harshly and where they're they don't want to stand out. You want to walk like everybody else, talk like everybody else. You don't want to have ideas that separate you from anybody. Because you can be disappeared. You'll face more violence. You'll have fewer resources. You're just basically your life is threatened. You don't want to stand out. People are watching for different. And so you start to act like everybody else. All your ideas have to be like everybody else. You have to talk about sports. You have to pretend you fit in. All right? Individuality gets destroyed. If you're an individual, it means you're different. It means it means you want to dress differently, think differently, act differently. The control elements don't want that. And then you have level groupings. Um, right now, in our society, and we all believe this to one extent or another, we, be, we believe that some people can jump higher than others based on their skin color, that some people dance better than others based on their skin color, that some people do math better than others based on their skin color, that some people drive better than others based on their skin color, um, that some people are smarter, that some people are more inclined towards things like being a pilot based on their skin color. It, it's pretty outrageous when you break it all down. It's absurd. Now what I want you to do is figure out how many people have a half heart ear. An ear that is attached to your earlobe. Your earlobes are attached. He's got them. Come on, you don't have them. He's got them. How many people have an earlobe that is attached that's not hanging? Yours are hanging. Hers are in between ears. His is hanging. Right? This is a genetic trait. This is a genetic trait. You pass this down. A widow's peak. How many people in here have a widow's peak? I don't have a widow's peak, but I have this hairline that naturally goes way up here to make it look like it's receding, right? <laughs> genetic trait. Blue eyes are a genetic trait. They're passed down to you. Now, genetically, in your life, who thinks that if I told you I could jump really high because my ear is attached to my head, that that sounds rational? I can drive way better than you. Look at my ears. <laughs> Do you know how good I am at math? I got the widow's peak. <laughs> you know what I can do mathematically, right? Um, we believe this for people's races. Your skin color dictates these things. We believe that for one genetic trait over another. Our earlobes are as important genetically as our skin color is. Yet for some reason we accept these groupings. Now why would these level groupings be created? To create control, right? It, people are fighting amongst races, if people are fighting amongst religions, then it's easier to control them. Right? The analogy to crabs in a bucket comes more true because people pull themselves down. They fight am amongst each other and they don't pay attention to the real issues. Who's really being controlled here? And it's not, I, I don't bring up race to say there's some dominating white superior hierarchy where white people are exploiting. I think that it's money. Rich people are exploiting. And they're not intentional, like, you know what, we're going to create racism. And then people are going to be racist to each other, and we're going to make way more money. No, it's a system where naturally people don't like what's different. And so you ex it gets exploited over time. Those who have money keep their money because nobody's paying attention to who doesn't have money. And nobody's paying attention to who has the most money. People are like, oh, well, you, you, you're this race or that race. Just like when we watched Crash, people are paying attention to the wrong thing. Level groupings. Um, how does it all begin? So you, there's got to be a way for all these things to come together. We're talking about, so far, as how do you control somebody? Now, in a dystopia, um, there's either too much control or no control at all. So you think about I Am Legend. What was the, the event that destroys an I Am Legend? Who knows? I Am Legend, disease. Will Smith, zombie Zom movie. Okay. Zombie disease? Yeah. Just fight Never mind. Um, we'll go to a different example. Yeah. Um, there's a unifying event. So what you have to think about is there's got to be a way where everything falls apart, where there's more control or less control. Because the dystopia has either chaos through too much control or chaos from no control at all. So it's either Mad Max, no law, everybody's out there on their own, or in the dystopia, there's a government that's controlling everything and it's got too much control. So real life event, 9-11 happens. You guys were barely alive, you're like three or four years old, and 
in many ways in schools, people are like, remember 9-11? You guys don't remember 9-11. Anybody remember what they were doing when that happened? There we go. Nobody remembers. And that makes sense that you shouldn't remember. Um, so this horrible event happens, and then less than a week later, they push the thing called the Patriot Act through. And now the Patriot Act essentially le allows um, this, this new monitoring task of terrorism. We're anti-terrorists. So anything that threatens the safety of the United States in any way, can be a, you can be detained and held indefinitely. That means for the rest of your life, if you are seen to be involved in terrorism. And what follows this is the arrest of many young Muslim citizens, people who have citizenship, who have been here, who are following all the laws, who are paying taxes, are detained for years for nothing other than they were sent an email from somebody who had a, a, an Arabic name. Um, so that's called fear-mongering. You start to stir up this sense of a them, them, them. And who are the thems in this country right now? Um, it used to be the German and the Japanese in World War II. And then it was the Vietnamese during the um, Vietnam War. Right now, what we have is we have Arab Americans who are being attacked, um, or people of Arab descent. Now, here's the crazy thing. It's not just people of Arab descent. Um, in our country, they did this survey, and they, they said, who can tell the difference between this and this? And they had Indians from India, and they had Arabs. And so they had people who um, don't eat cow and people who don't eat pig. And 60% of our country couldn't tell the difference between Hindu and um, Islam. That's pretty absurd because they're completely different. There are no similarities at all. In fact, there's more similarity between Christianity and Judaism and Islam than there is between Hindu and Islam. Those three religions are tied together at the core. They all spread from the same place. Okay, So we have this place where it's fear-mongering. People are afraid, and when people are afraid, they do stupid things and they accept stupid control. And so you have this unifying event that comes place in a dystopia, it comes forward. And it either destroys everything or it allows for the government to come together and take more control. And so you imagine in 9-11 we have the Patriot Act, and then we have fear-mongering around terrorism, which is focused on Arabs and people of Arab descent. Okay. Um, in V for Vendetta, there's a horrible event that takes place that allows the government to step in and take more control over the citizenship. Um, the reason this works, human nature, it's not a flaw in certain people, it's a flaw in all people. When something bad happens, one thing we do to survive is we get rid of everything that's different. We start to hate things that are different. The other thing we want is we want to blame somebody. And so, what they do after a, a horrible event is they always put a face up. They, it's easier to blame one person than it is to blame a group of people, but then that one person is attached to a group of people. And so our brain, psychologically, in order to relax, needs somebody to blame. The unknown doesn't work well in our minds. So what happens is they use this unifying horrible event to kind of jump in and be a savior. So some people orchestrate it. For example, um, you can think about um, who watches the, um, what's the scary video game? With what's her name and she shoots people? President Evil. President Evil. And they release the thing on purpose oh, and they're yeah. out there fighting against it, right? So it can be an intentional, horrible event that somebody uses to step in, or it can be an accident. Some people believe 9 11 is too convenient. That when those planes crashed in, the government had to have known something about it, but they let it happen anyways. Some people believe that, that it was allowed to happen so it could become a unifying event that allowed us to start a conflict in the Middle East to get more of a stronghold on oil. Because the oil reserves, they weren't running out, but the government there was saying, we're going to give you less and less, or we're going to charge you differently. And we're saying, nope, we want more of a stronghold. We want to be able to control this element, this resource. Okay? Um, again, what this causes is polarization. How does it all begin? You have no middle. Things get too far, and that's happening in this country with what? Who knows the movement that happened in the last few years that resulted in riots and changes all over the world? You have the 1% versus 99. Communism? Huh? Okay. You said communism? Um, that's an idea that comes out of this. Communism is the idea that everybody gets the same, no matter who they are. So doctors make the same amount as garbage people, as um, nurses as gardeners, as teachers, everybody makes the same. That's the idea of communism. Now that's not horribly flawed in of itself that everybody will make the same. Here's the problem though. Um, the way communism has existed is everybody doesn't get the same. In history what happens is the politicians and the super rich people still get more. But you gotta be on the inside circle. If you're not on the inside circle then you make the same as everybody else, right? 
And so all the food is rationed for everybody, and everybody gets the same amount, which isn't a horrible concept. I'm going to finish this, and we're going to start the movie in the next class. So I'll see you tomorrow, and I'll finish this, and we'll start the movie. We're dead. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Yo.